so it's a huge privilege to introduce um, our amazing panelists that we have up here. Um, we really wanted to get a conversation hearing from local grassroots leaders, people who are um, doing real important work in the community and just hear um, their stories and, and their work and um, hopefully get inspired. So we have, um, they'll be telling you um, their own story, but um, just running down the line, we've got Angel, Ines, Laverne, Jean Bradley, Michelle, and can I call you Pastor Jean? Is that okay? To differentiate, we have Jean Bradley and Pastor Jean. Um, so I will let them um, tell you about themselves. And we also have an amazing moderator, Bradley, here with us today. He was our uh, youth um, leadership speaker at last year's conference, and he's back to help us uh, facilitate a conversation today. So thank you all so much, and I'm so excited to hear this conversation. Now, just want to start off the conversation. This is about leadership here. And each and every single individual up here are community leaders. So can we have a round of applause for our community leaders? I'm going to kick it off real quick. First question. I want everyone to introduce themselves, what you do in the community, and what inspires you to do the work that you do as well. Let's keep it to, you know, about two to five minutes, and let's get it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Jean Belazir, and I've been working in the community for 15 years. I actually work at Brockton High Point Drug Treatment Center as a spiritual consultant, helping to motivate those that are in recovery. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to participate in this panel. My name is Michelle Dubois, and I'm a state representative for the 10th Plymouth District, which includes Brockton, West Bridgewater, and East Bridgewater. And um, I'm a real grassroots type of representative, and I love my job, and I appreciate everything that um, all that you have done to help me get into this position. And I look forward to participating in this panel, so thank you very much. How you guys doing? Well, before I start, I would like you guys to give yourself a round of applause for being here. Come on, go ahead. Excellent. Well, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jean Bradley Dounoko. That's a French pronunciation of it, but most people call me Jean. We got Jean Pastor. We got Jean, who's not a pastor. I think it's pretty cool. So it's an honor for me uh, to be here and actually being part of this amazing panel. Um, in terms of what I do, um, uh, I work for Senator Michael Brady, I'm his Director of Constituent Services. Um, I formed Haiti six years ago, so Pastor Jean has been in this country for a little bit longer than me, and um, I think it's amazing for me, not just to sit here, but also to be part of this. And I think throughout this, you will get to know me better, and let's do it. Good morning, my name is Laverne Gordon, and I am the founder and president of Love Life Now Foundation. Uh, we promote year-round awareness against domestic violence. It's an issue that we're passionate about. It's something that we seek to keep in the forefront as much as possible. Um, and we're here today to be part of this panel to hopefully raise some awareness, not just talk about leadership, but hopefully raise some awareness on it. So thank you guys and the Family Center for having us. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias a todos. My name is Inez Figueroa. I'm a director of the Latin Women Association in Brockton. It's an association that uh, we opened like two years ago and I share space at Latin uh, Family Center. I work with the Latinos community because there's no, uh, no other place the Latino can go. I do immigration, translation, anything that we uh, can help those Latinos in this community. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Angel Cosme, and um, thank you all for being here today. Um, I am a teacher. I work at Brockton High School. I'm a life skills special education teacher. Uh, prior to that, I, I worked with uh, Brockton Interfaith as a community organizer for a little under a year. Um, I've worked as a clinician. I, I've done a lot of volunteer work in, in, in the community, uh, a youth advocate, youth mentor. Um, so I'm all about uh, trying to get people to mobilize around the injustices that exist and for them to take some action to try to remedy it. Thank you. Um, 
For those who don't know me, my name is Bradley Souffrant. I have a class at Brockton High School called TTY, Teach the Truth to the Youth, after school program catered to black students to learn their true history. Have an organization called YIC, stands for Young Inner City Kids. And what we do is make our youth aware of themselves and their surroundings. So let's start off with the leadership conference right here. Are you ready? Okay, okay. Well, first, I'm, I'm curious to know your stories and how, how, how does that influence the work that you do today? So we're gonna start it off with Angel. All right, my story, we don't have enough time. Uh, but I, I'll be brief. Um, so I, I thought about that question and um, definitely identity. I, I, cultural identity is, is part of my story. I'm Puerto Rican, I have two Puerto Rican parents and um, you know, fast forward, when I graduated from high school, I, I didn't think I wanted to go to college. I, I took a year off and then went to college and dropped out. And then 12 years later, I, I re-enrolled and, and I went on to get my degree, uh, my bachelor's degree in uh, psychology, and then I went on to get my master's degree in education. Um, my sister, who's an educator for many years, for years has told me that I should go into teaching and I didn't think I, I should. Um, and the last year, when, it, when I was a senior, I had a professor who was Puerto Rican who constantly was telling me, you should go into education. Long story short, she convinced me, I did it, um, and it's the best decision I've made. I've been teaching for five years. So when, when, you, when I talk about my story, it's absolutely about empowering young people for many, many reasons. I have a son who, who's, uh, who's in high school, who's in ninth grade, uh, 14 years old, about to be 15. But I personally vividly remember being a young person and making some good decisions and some not good decisions. One particular decision that I made when I was a young man changed my life. It, it displaced me from my family. Um, and uh, it actually introduced me to uh, a teen ministry that, that really gave me the foundation. So when, you, when I talk about my story, I, I have to mention that for those two or three years that I was in that teen ministry, it gave me a foundation of spirituality that I have to this day. I'm not, I'm not a religious person, um, but my philosophy of, of spirituality is simple. Love one another and help to alleviate pain and suffering. And that's, that's what I try to do every day. Um, as far as young people, I, like I said earlier, my, my whole goal is to um, get them to care enough about injustices and, and take action. And so um, my story is about my, my culture, uh, my upbringing, um, you know, the church foundation, fatherhood, education, um, teaching, and then, of course, activism. Thank you. I think I'm in the same way with Angel. If I told my story, it would be like forever. It's a long story. Um, I work as a domestic violence and sexual assault counselor um, almost for 25 years in this company. Um, I retired three years ago. And I decide to open my own Latin Women Association uh, on domestic violence. I come from a background of domestic violence. I was a, a victim of domestic violence by my husband. I had to run away from Newark, New Jersey to Boston, Massachusetts without knowing anybody. But I was, I was take care of my family and myself and leave him alone. Uh, I, I, I did what I had to do for my kids. I start new life in, in Boston. Uh, that was like in 1974. I, I grew up most of the time in Boston with my kids. I, my passion is domestic violence because I come from that background as a wife and a mother. Uh, I was abused for 11 years. Um, until I said, enough is enough. I need to move on. And that's what I did. Um, <laughs> So I encourage every woman, I, I do a group of domestic violence for Latinas, I do a sexual assault counselor, um, anything for these women to, they can get away from the abuser, I help them because I come from that background. Thank you. So Inez's story probably mirrors a ton of other people's stories that you may know as well. Um, I am one of them. I, um, as, as I come to this work as a survivor myself. Um, I grew up watching my mother be brutally beat by my father uh, in the island of Trinidad. 
Um, this was not easy to watch because um, we're talking about when you t when you hear about domestic violence, you hear about the slapping, the kicking, the verbal abuse. This was machetes that he would take and chop her with. This was beer bottles that he would break and stab her with. And this was our normal. Uh, for 15 years, I watched that happen uh, until uh, he let me, my father that is, migrate to the States and uh, to per finish my education here. I did. And I always told myself I would never be that person. I would never be my mother. Uh, unfortunately, children that grow up in a home, an abusive home, they tend to either become the victim or the abuser. Not all the time, but oftentimes. And I was no exception. I fell into a relationship by the time I was uh, 21 with a man. And people tend to often ask, well, why didn't you just leave? and it's not that easy. It is not a black and white issue. And so um, I fell into this relationship and it lasted for two years until I got to my breaking point, uh, which is the last night he beat me and I ended up in the hospital. That being said, um, I was able to escape with my life. There's many, as, as everybody I think on this panel, if I had to tell my story, it usually takes about 90 minutes. I can tell you that because I do workshops on this issue with teens um, now. Uh, to, to recognize the signs on how you can fall into these relationships and how to recognize the signs. So I reached to my breaking point and fast forward 10 years later, I took part in a beauty pageant um, as a dare from some friends of mine and ended up winning the local leg and had to go on to the national leg in LA to participate there as well. Well, I ended up winning there too. And uh, came back to Boston with two titles on my hand and had to uh, delegate a platform and domestic violence was an easy choice. I took up that platform and for about a year I volunteered with a domestic violence shelter here in Brockton um, while I had those titles and came about these initiatives that I started. And once the title was up and the year was up, I realized that it was a passion in me that I really wanted to continue this work, which is what formed Love Life Now Foundation. Six years later, here we are, um, continuously putting on initiatives that get people out and about talking about this issue. Too often people are finding out about shelters and resources when they get to a hospital, as I did, um, or a police station. And we don't want that to be the case. We think awareness is more than half the battle. If you know, you're better informed, you're pretty much more likely not to go that route. So that's what we do. We, cr we create awareness year round. Um, and I can say that my childhood, my own relationship is, is exactly what propelled me into this work. I didn't know you, if you'd asked me 10 years ago if this is what we were going to be doing, I could tell you that would not be the case. There was no way. I was never gonna tell anybody that I was involved in something like that because it's a shameful subject. Nobody wants to admit that they're in the tech, these types of relationships. And that's the battle that we face when we deal with domestic violence. One in every four women will be abused in their lifetime. The problem with that stat is that it could be you, 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 or you, and you're not speaking up. And that's the battle that we face with this issue. So we take it as uh, <laughs> a duty to speak up for those that can't. And there are many other uh, forces that are doing the same thing, but the little that, that we can do as individuals, I think is going to help. So thank you so much for having us again. Wow, um, those stories are pretty amazing, right? Um, excellent. Um, and again, I think I just said it that my name is John Bradley Duane Card, and by that name, you can see that I come from a different places in the sense of my accent. Um, you know, to tell my story sometimes takes me like two hours because I do give a, a few speeches, but I'll do my best to see how I can summarize it. Um, I was born in Haiti. I'm 27, just turned 27, and um, I lost my mother, my biological mom, when I was four. And um, after my mom died, and one of my mom's sisters, the oldest one, took over and took me under her responsibility. Um, it wasn't until I was 11 that I knew that my biological mom was not alive. And um, if you ask me how did she keep the secret, I don't know. I think she just trying to give me a reason to not think about having a, a mom who's not alive. At that point, she was my mother. And unfortunately, in 1990, she got sick. And, um, you know, she was not able to get back on track. And in 2003, I'm talking about my mom's sister, she died. 
And um, after that point, it was kind of like tough for me because 2003, I was what, 13 years old in Haiti. So life can be tough for those of us um, who was born there. But fortunately, with good friends and good family members, I was able to continue doing um, what my aunt want me to do. And um, I choose not to call her aunt because I think she's my mom, but you will see, you will hear me using aunt and mom. So you will know the difference between my biological mom and my stepmom. So um, after she passed, fortunately, um, one of my cousins vowed that I should go to school and do my best. And um, let me just tell you this straight. In the life of a child in Haiti, not having a mom and a dad there for you, life can be tough. I've seen it, I live it, and I witness it. But I can tell you that because of those people, I was able to navigate. This is just a story in Haiti. Um, you know, throughout school, I did pretty well, and I love my teachers. They always give me a reason to believe that I can do something. And I'm going to tell you this straight. So in my country, we have two languages. We have French and we have Creole. Most of the girls at the school they speak French. In order for you to talk to them, you got to speak French. So because of that desire to talk to some of the girls, you know, I was able to actually put it fluent in French and do well in school. And I can recall it when I was in sixth grade, I did very well because of a girl that I like so much and I really want to talk to her, but I know she wouldn't talk to me. Uh, she wouldn't talk to me in Korea, so I had to let the French, you know, I did pretty well start doing all my love letters. I think some of you guys are too young, you don't know what I'm talking about, but for those of you who are over that age, you will know it. But um, as you recall, in 2010, something happened in Haiti. Do you guys recall what happened in Haiti in 2010? Okay, in 2010, we had a bad earthquake. And at that point, I bet it wasn't just Haiti that got hurt, it was, I believe, the entire world. I was there. I was there living and witness a lot of things. And that girl, which I just described, she died during the earthquake. And um, I usually don't talk about it because I choose to keep it to myself. Oh, speaking of that, I wrote a book called A Young Man's Journey. It's in the process of being published now. When that book come out, you will know more about that girl. But I saw that beautiful, amazing young woman in the morning in school, and at first something she died. From that moment, it wasn't true because I'm like, how could you possibly, you know, let let go like that? But you know, it's life, and um, she was not the only one who passed. Fortunately, I survived. I cannot tell you that anything touched me. I was fortunate; not even a piece of dust taught me during that moment. But I had friends who got killed. I have families member who probably hurt and who got house that destroyed. This is just nothing. But from that moment, I come to understand that every second, every minute, every hour in our life means something. And we should value it. And um, it's a long story. I don't think I'll be able to tell you everything. But let me just um, cut it short. So I live this moment from, to that, from, from, to that, from, this, from January 12, 2010 until December 6, 2010 which means I lived the entire moment after the earthquake in Haiti. So fortunately, I have a wonderful father who um, chooses to bring me in this country. So I moved to Massachusetts December 6, 2000, um, December 6 2010. And um, my sister picked me at the airport. Unfortunately, I was dressing like I was in Haiti. The moment I landed at Logan Airport and stepped out, I realized it was a whole different ballgame. So I was cold and freezing and all that. But my wonderful sister, Dina, she bought me a coat. Guess what, I've never heard about code before, for what? So she said, honey, put it on you and you will be fine. And in my country, we usually use the coal, but she said, I'm gonna put some heat for you so you can warm up and all that. So we were driving home and as I was coming from Logan Airport to Brockton, and um, I realized that my life was not gonna be the same. But I was very scared. I was scared because I did not know anybody else other than my family. I was scared because I could not speak a word of this language, and I was scared because I didn't know what I was going to do. Fortunately, I was able to navigate, and uh, my sister was very nice to me. She took me to the Brockton Library. This was the place I started to learn English, and I did pretty well. And from there, I moved to Training Resources of America, where I got my GED because I was in the process of graduating from high school in 80. And from there, I went to Massasoit Community College, where I graduated with a double major and a certificate, and I met AJ down there. So we did pretty well, and then for Massachusetts, um, I moved to Suffolk University, where I got my bachelor and all that. As of right now, I'm doing a master. So this is what I've done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this is what I've done in the past uh, six years and, and six months. And, uh, and yeah, well, thank you so much, Rob Dubai. And, and last year, I became a US citizen. So I celebrated and all that.
And, um, and, and to be honest with you, let me just say this about this kid. And watching this kid doing what he's doing in this community, it's very inspiring. And I hope you folks can actually open your heart and let him navigate and give him a reason to continue doing what he's doing now. So I think he's an amazing young man, so I can see myself in him. So let's face it, you know, not knowing a word of English, not knowing anybody else, learn the language, navigate, become a U.S. citizen, and now I am running for city council at large. I think this is the American story. That is the American dream, and this is the story that we need to tell. I believe I will be able to give you more detail throughout this conversation based on the question that you will ask but here's what I can tell you, just in case I forgot. Nothing is impossible. Believe in God, believe in you, and believe in those who believe in you. Yes. And all of that, you will do our best, okay? Well, there are some quite impressive people up here. Good job, Jean. I'm proud of you. Um, I grew up in Brockton. Um, to parent home, but with a lot of uh, financial and alcohol struggles. Um, had some great siblings. Um, did all right in school. I wouldn't say that I was uh, the straight A student, but I also wasn't failing out either. I was able to go to college. Um, it was very much a struggle paying for that for my family, and a lot of it I did on my own. Um, then I graduated from college, had a series of different jobs, I uh, moved to California, lived with my aunt and uncle for a while and worked in their credit bureau, and then decided I missed my family. So the man I met there, who I'm now married to, Adam Swinson, we came back to Brockton and we moved in with my parents and I got a series of jobs and decided I really wanted to change the world because I've always been um, very much into helping others. I live by the motto, no one's free when others are oppressed, and I really want to struggle to live that every day in my life. So um, I worked at Pine Street Inn, which is a homeless shelter, New England shelter for homeless veterans, St. Francis House, um, Courageous Sailing Center, and then before I became a state representative um, at South Coastal County's Legal Services, which provides free legal assistance to low-income people and senior citizens, domestic violence victims, people struggling with cancer, benefit issues, housing issues. Um, and during that time, uh, before becoming a state representative, I was a city councilor from Ward 6 as a part-time job for 10 years. And that's when, um, before being a city councilor, I moved back home from California, got these series of jobs at nonprofits, lived with, married my husband, and um, got involved in grassroots activism um, through trying to stop a garbage transfer station from coming to Brockton. Kind of in the line of no one's free when others are oppressed, why does Newton and Wellesley get to transfer their garbage in Brockton onto rails and ship it out to the Midwest? I'm not garbage and neither are my neighbors, so why is this appropriate? And we see it time and time again in low-income communities, communities of color, Massachusetts, across the United States and around the world, that it seems as though certain people's lives in other people's opinion are more important than um, others. And I don't agree with that, and I like to fight back on that. So we won that battle, and then the woman who was a city councilor was going to be the chief of staff for the mayor, so I ran for that seat, worked very hard. And during my 10 years on the city council, I've always been an advocate for um, the person that's being put down or the person that needs help. And it's the number one thing I liked being a city councilor was constituent services. And now at the state house, I do the same. I have a lot of enrichment and feeling of uh, strength and get a lot of um, benefit out of being able to help people in any way I can. Um, and I just want to say that uh, I think the way that we should all live being fellow Brocktonians and living here now is I try to just not judge anyone. And I like struggle. I think struggle, if you live in Brockton or you live in an urban community, there's always going to be struggle. And I think struggle is very difficult when you're going through it, but it really forges a special type of person with a strong character and a willingness to help others. So I think that no one should be embarrassed of struggle because that's what life is all about. Life is about suffering and overcoming it and moving on and being successful and sometimes not winning. Um, but if you just keep on being persistent, I think that, that you'll ultimately accomplish and feel good about your life. So that's what I encourage everyone to do, and that's what I try to do, and I'm happy to be here with all of you today. Thank you.
Well, it's a privilege and honor for me to be able to be part of this group this morning to be able to share a little bit of my story, the abbreviated version of it. I grew up in Brockton, and I um, always had the ambition to want to become a professional basketball player. I think every inner city kid uh, has dreams, hopes, and aspirations of trying to play some kind of sport in the hopes of uh, being famous, in the hope of being known for their capabilities and so forth. So I wanted to play basketball, and uh, I was pretty good at that time. And uh, I told myself that I would never do some things. How many people in here have ever told themselves that they would never do something, but ended up doing the thing that you said that you would not do? So I told myself I would never, um, you know, smoke marijuana. I would never drink alcohol. I would never involve myself in crime. I would never do certain things. And within a year after I made those promises to myself, I deviated in the wrong direction. And after deviating in the wrong direction, I started to take a downward spiral in school. My grades weren't up. My parents were becoming concerned. They sensed that something was going on. Couldn't quite put a finger on it. Well, I got arrested in Brockton for a highly publicized crime where a person was robbed and stabbed, a crime that I'm guilty of. And while I was locked up, um, I uh, met a group by the name of God's Posse. And they were a group of ex-gang members, stick-up kids, drug dealers, guys that have been incarcerated with braids, fades, and, and dreads. And they looked just like me, but yet they were coming in with a message of hope and inspiration that your life could be changed, that you're not in a hopeless situation where you can't come out of the pit that you found yourself in. And so while I was incarcerated, I listened to them and I, and I embraced them and they embraced me as well. And I decided that I was going to change my life and the kind of impact that they had on me, I wanted to have on somebody else because I saw the value in that. I served a, a eight to 10 year prison sentence. I was released in uh, 2000, January 22nd of 2000. When I walked out those doors, I walked out those doors with the assurance that I wanted to change my life and that I wanted to be involved in changing the life of others. And so therefore, when I got out, you know, I, I, I went ahead and went through school, graduated at Massasoit Community College, I had already obtained a GED right now. I'm a student at Bridgewater State University. I became, I became a pastor. Thank you. I became a pastor, which is something that I always wanted to do. I, I'm a former community organizer with Brockton Interfaith Community Program Coordinator with um, Safe Corners. I've had many different um, experiences in Brockton, and I love Brockton. I love the work that's going on in Brockton, and I see the need that's going on in Brockton. So if there's anything that I want you to glean or to be able to get from um, uh, you know, my story in the abbreviated version is that whatever efforts you make on whatever level to whoever you reach out to and whatever it is that you're doing, and don't feel that you're not making an impact because if somebody would tell me that I'd be sitting, you know, that was 20 something years ago, sitting on a panel with a bunch of wonderful people sharing my story, participating in a leadership conference and helping to empower leaders to continue to do the things that they're already doing, I would say, listen, you're lying to me. You, 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 this is not going to happen. I would not believe you. But, you know, whenever you're doing a work and you're doing an impact, impactful thing, it, it has a ripple effect in the life of people. And so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. God bless. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. So I just wanted to ask um, all the leaders up here because in our community right now, there is a bunch of division. It's, it's, you can see it as clear as day. Now, each of us are leaders and we must have a way to bring people together. What is the best way to unify the masses in our community? And then on top of that, there's so many issues. What issue do we focus on as a whole? where everyone is getting affected by at the same time so we can actually make substantial change. Because we have so many leaders, but it seems like we have too many different causes as to where nothing is getting done. And a bunch of the, the majority of the citizens feel exactly the same way as I feel. Now I'm looking to you for the answer. Who wants to take the mic? That's a loaded question, and it's not going to be a simple answer. I know you're looking for an answer, but there really is one, at least in my opinion. You mentioned that there is a ton of division. On what level are you talking about? One. And then, wait, number two, you mentioned that there are a ton of different causes that people advocate for. I think where we start is each of our entities recognizing that 
each of our causes means something. Mm -hmm. And so the people that come out and represent for each cause, they care about that because it's affected them in one way. Domestic violence, gang violence, city issues, uh, city, city council issues, <laughs> you know, just everything, education, everything that each of us does mean something to someone. So I think with us at the forefront saying, look, Angel is hosting or having something that I think may resonate with you, sharing what's going on with, with between each other, I think is a start, right? Um, and as far as the division goes, I, I'd love to, I guess, ask more on what level are you referring to? Well, I think we're all people. Regardless of culture, we're all people, but for some reason, people are divided between the people. And you want to look at the Caribbean and African community that you have in Brockton, division within there. And then you have the white and black division. So I'm talking about unity on a mass scale when it comes to everyone in our community. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking the first shot. That was pretty good. Anyway, brief. Um, I mean, I think one word that I'm going to use, and I'm going to do my best to give you uh, a little bit. This is a very complex question. So I want you to understand that. I don't think um, we have the time to actually um, dive into it. But when it's come down to social issues, when it's come down to people, when it's come down to doing stuff together, there's one word that um, I consider. It's empathy. It's like, how do you... How do you empathize with the person you are talking to without even knowing who he, who he or she is? Because the thing is that one of the problems that we have in our society is the fact that we assume stuff. By assuming, you know, we come up with judgment. And judgment leads us to all kind of mindset. and can be that very detrimental, not just to you, but also to the person you're talking to. And now, let me just move on. Before I actually say anything, I would like to say thank you to Mark Lindy for coming here because this is one of the guys that actually teach me about empathy. And I'm gonna tell you why. So, now, here we are on that panel, you see, I'm Haitian. Uh, Michelle Dubra, she's not Haitian. Um, obviously, you're not Haitian. So, we are, we have different cultures on that panel, right? But here we are, sharing ideas and talking about what's going on in our lives and what's going on in our city. The only reason why we are doing it is because we have something that we believe in together. I would call it, we are somewhat like-minded. But guess what, we do have differences. I mean, just because I believe in something doesn't mean Michelle Dubois believes in it. Doesn't mean the person on my right believes in it. But now, how do we put aside our differences and dive into what we believe in as a group? And I think to focus on Brockton, I think one of the biggest problem that we have in this city is because We've been, we have people who've been in this city for so many years who are unable and unwilling to change. Change is important. You cannot grow without changing. But face it, a little baby was born. Well, somebody has to carry that baby and all that. I don't have any babies, so my analogy may not be good, but I'm just brushing it. But I think you have to have somebody you know, who can give you a reason to believe. The former governor of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick, whom I worked for as an intern, he said to me, in order for you to, to convince someone to do something, you have to give that person a reason to believe in it. You have to give them a reason to hope and a reason to know that what you are asking for is something that you are willing to do. But in our society, some people are more likely to ask us to do certain things, but when you question them, they assume that you are arrogant. And of course, sometimes you can be arrogant. I'm not a pastor, but I think some people call Jesus arrogant. Dr. King was arrogant. A few other people was arrogant. But I think in our community, we got to be able to find the common ground, to understand that this is a boat. We are all on it. We do need a captain to navigate. But guess what? It is our responsibility to making sure that everybody is safe. It's not just about the Haitian. It's not just about the Caverdian or the Caucasian. It's about us. We have to have one city. We got to believe in the place that we belong to. And until we are able to do it, we're going to move on. And I think some people are very, very comfortable when it's come down to social issues because they don't want you to ask any questions. If you do, they feel like you, you, know, you are threatening them. But guess what? If I don't ask questions, how do I know? And especially for the politician, I think you 
have the power to vote for anybody that you want to. And your vote does matter. And when you vote for someone, don't let them step on you. You tell them what you want them to do. And I think that's what we have to do. That's what we gotta stand for. You gotta vote, folks. Vote for the folks you want. Vote for the person that you believe will represent you. Not just about local elections, not just about city elections, it's about every elections. Because you matter. I matter. All of us. It is our job to make sure that the society that we are living on is follow the rules that we created and we with a capital W. And until then, it will always be problematic because we have a lack of empathy. We gotta be able to empathize, folks. Let's do this. All right, so since this is a leadership conference, leadership is about doing what you think is right in the face of opposition, in the face of struggle, in the face of um, people disparaging you, people um, maybe saying some very nasty things about you, um, propagating lies, um, trying to really hurt you, um, to silence you. And leadership is about not being silenced, but doing it in a respectful way. And that's what it's about. It's about understanding that everybody is equal, and again, trying not to judge. I think empathy is the best skill we could teach our population, and it's really lacking in so much of our world. We all live in Brockton, we live in a diverse city, and what I love about it is I go multiple places and I feel comfortable all the time. But I meet a lot of people who grew up in communities that are 95% white, and they step out of that community into the normal world where everybody is different, and they feel uncomfortable. I don't know if they did not learn empathy or what it means to be among people that don't look exactly like them or from different cultures, but that's what Brockton struggles with as a group. If you're white or black or immigrant, or if you've been here multiple generations, if you're living in Brockton, you're struggling with a lot of judgment from the outside in, and that judgment is based on, um, I believe, corporate power, trying to put certain groups of people down in order for them to benefit. And it's really hard to explain to everybody that we're all being hurt by this type of corporatism in the corporate America that's really um, hurting us as individuals. So for me, the division is on purpose, Bradley. They want to divide us so we can't win. And if they can figure out a way to divide me from you, or you to think that my having to return $100 of donations is actually illegal, or, or using the media to propagate bad images about certain people and good images about the other. It's hard, it, so it all comes down to media literacy as well. Because what is being put out into our community isn't always accurate. So it, it's tough, Bradley. You just gotta keep on keeping on and know that sometimes um, people are gonna say very mean things about leaders as we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. Look, John Lewis has been a congressman for how long? What, going on 40 years from Atlanta? I saw him recently when he did the commencement speech at Mass College of Liberal Arts where I graduated from. I went back because I love him so much and I heard he was speaking. And his message to the people was get in the way. When you see something that's wrong, get in the way. You may not, you might have to get in what he calls good trouble, but sometimes you have to get in good trouble. And this is a man who was spit on, he was beat down, and now he's a congressman, and he said that the last, he's been arrested 40 times in his life. This is Congressman John Lewis, and uh, the last time he was arrested, it was around comprehensive immigration reform. Now you would think that that doesn't really affect him, right? but he has obviously empathy. So um, I just think that we just gotta keep fighting and sometimes people are gonna do mean things to us even though we don't deserve it and we just have to get through the struggle and, and stay on the right side. I think that as a community, we have to recognize when we talk about cultural difference and focusing on one issue as Bradley was mentioning, that we have to, we, we work and we operate inter interdependently. 
and that every community and every and everybody in that community and every cultural background, every race, every language, every tongue has their own particular gifts and their own particular abilities. And when we respect the fact that somebody has this gift and I have that gift, somebody brings this to the table and I bring that to the table, and when we let everybody just stay in their lane. Look at the person next to you and say, stay in your lane. If you can just let that person stay in their lane and operate on the level that they operate and be who they are and be good at what they do, now a community can come in and can work on an issue. I think when you try to change people, when you try to make them fit your mold, when you try to make them fit your agenda, when you try to make them fit your mission and try to you know, change the uniqueness of an individual or a group of people, now you have a problem. And, and now you have a problem with people working together because you, you're trying to change somebody in the gifts that they bring to the table. Are you guys following what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you have interdependence where I need you, you need me, we, 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 we're, our, we're our own person, our own culture, thank you, but I need you and you need me and you bring a certain level of gifts to the table, table and I do, and you respect that. I think there's a lack of mutual respect in the community mm -hmm. for what, what a culture brings, what an organization brings, what a language brings, and when there's a level of respect, when that increases first amongst the leaders, it's going to trickle down to the community, then when it trickles down to the community, everybody's going to have an aha moment, and they're going to say, now we get it, now we know what we need to do. We're going to have interdependence, you bring something to the table, I bring something to the table. Maybe somebody's good with money, you're good with money, that's your thing. Maybe somebody's good with organizing, you're good with organizing, that's your thing. You're good with speaking, that's your thing. When we say stay in your lane, you operate best in your lane, but all together, we're going to accomplish a greater mission as a whole. Now we can start to work together, and now we can start to see a difference, and now we can start to uh, have an impact. But when I try to change you, and you try to change me, you try to tweak this and adjust that, you're, 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 what you're doing is robbing somebody of their uniqueness and of their ability and, and the gifts that they bring to the table. <laughs> I'm going to piggyback on what Gene said because it goes back to what I was saying earlier is that each, indivi each individual up here has a gift that they are destined to advocate for and we're doing that and so when we're doing that just within our own communities we see that you talked about the aha moment people are not necessarily going to jump up and say I want to support domestic violence awareness well guess what that doesn't affect them they don't care about it because it's not in their circle. People aren't going to jump up and say, oh, I'm, I'm an advocate for education. Because guess what? They have no kids. Or guess what? They were wronged by the system. So when they see, when everybody sees that they are, people see that they're at, people are at, you are doing what you do, at best at the gift that you're given, I think, again, that aha moment's going to come, that everybody's going to come together and advocate for that one particular cause and vice versa. We don't necessarily have to say, oh gosh, uh, Angel, you need to be at this domestic violence awareness event. Laverne, you need to be at this education event. It's going to come together eventually because everybody's going to see that everybody's participating as a whole, as a group. So I, I, agree, I absolutely agree with Jean, is that you continue to use your gifts, your God-given talent, or whatever it is that you feel that you're passionate about, to advocate for that cause. And eventually, we, we have to come together. Okay, getting everybody together, working together, uh, Angel and myself and other agencies, we organized a date without immigrants in Brockton. And let me tell you, that was more than 200 people participate in the march in the city hall, excluding him. He was putting everybody together and everybody, but it was a wonderful idea. I think we're gonna do it again next year. I mean, it was the first time in Brockton that that happened. And I was very, very surprised there was two, more than 200 people. Um, and it, it's amazing how different cultural, different people get together and walk a day without immigrants. And that was something that I, I was amazing about it. And I was like surprised there were so many people show up there. I agree with what everyone said, and, and um, I just want to add, actually, I just want to ask everyone a, a question. Um, I, know, I know this is a church, and, I, and I, I'm not a spiritual person, but how many of you are people of faith, however you define that? People who believe in a, in a higher power, um, God, or whatever you want to call it. I see most hands, right? So if you read the scriptures, whatever it is, whatever denomination or, or preference, 
um, there's like a, a, what I would call like a universal truth, a, a consciousness that we all have. We all know what's right and wrong, right? When you understand that, when you understand that, that you and I, regardless of our age, gender, whatever the social construct is, uh, race, ethnicity, that we all are human beings, that your life matters, my life matters, and that we have a vested interest in preserving our lives, right? When you really understand that, and it's grounded in, in, in all spirituality truths, right? This, this concept. Um, that's, for me, what, what does it. And, and, and again, you know, I don't go to church every Sunday. I don't read the Bible every day. I don't pray every day. But I, but I love people, honestly. I love people, and out of that love, I wish to alleviate pain and suffering. So that's what did it to me, but it was that word indifference where uh, in college I took a class called Race, Class, and Gender, and the professor asked us, I mean, she introduced the word indifference. Indifference means you don't care either way. It doesn't affect you. Um, if you're not an undocumented immigrant and, and you're, you're a citizen and you've never experienced the hardships that goes with that, perhaps, not, not everyone, but perhaps you're indifferent. It doesn't affect you. You don't care either way. That challenged me, and, and, and it made me want to do more in my community, and, and I started volunteering back then. It was with uh, Brockton Interfaith. Started uh, advocating to bring a drug court to Brockton, and you know, from then it was a trajectory of getting involved. If you care about the world and, and, the, and the damage that the world is uh, undergoing, if you will, um, then do something. And, and that's what I've done, and, and that's what I would encourage you to do. But what grounds that is this, this, this realization that, that we're human beings and we need to care for one another. And when, once everyone realizes that, I, I guarantee you, we'll eradicate a lot of the problems in this world. Thank you, thank you. So, what I realize is that, one, majority of the community in Brockton is not voting. And this is just in a country, like, people are not voting. And the reality of the situation is that politics, in a sense, has failed the people. And there's many politicians who are coming up, and this is election year, and they are asking for the votes of the people. They want the people to trust them. They want the people to vote them in. But we've been proven countless and countless of times that when politicians get in there, majority of the things they told us on the road to getting into office is not what they uphold when they're in the seat. So why should the people trust the people who are campaigning now? And what makes you different as leaders from those politicians who continuously tell lies? So I want everyone to know um, that having gone through six successful elections, I, I am humbled, honored, and thankful for having this seat and being able to be a spokesperson for everyone that lives in my district. Um, if I get a phone call, I try to respond. If I can help a veteran from World War II increase his disability percent, I'm gonna drive to the veterans agent's office and get conversations. If there's a woman who is um, homeless or a family is homeless, I'm gonna work for them. I'm gonna be their advocate. If you're having struggles, uh, maybe you got laid off or you're having issues with a workers' comp, Question, I had one woman who um, had been denied her unemployment benefits after already receiving $8,000 and they wanted her to pay it back and I tried to get her a lawyer and I couldn't get her a lawyer so I went to the hearing with her I didn't, uh, and she wound up winning. So I got a lot of success out of that but she got success out of that as well. When Inez came to me and looked for, was looking for a place to start her place, we were able to find her a place. I try to do whatever I can for people. I grew up in Brockton. I grew up in the Brookfield, Ashfield area of Brockton. Um, I don't really, I, everybody sees color because we can see. But I grew up in a community where, sure, there was racism, but so many of the white people that I grew up with um, just aren't racist. Everybody has internal bias. Um, and I now see a lot of the white folks I grew up with married to all different types of people and have beautiful children that have all different types of skin color. And that's the great thing about living in Brockton. So I see the inside, I try to see the inside of people. I try to be a person of my word. That's how I got brought up. My mother's a spitfire, everybody loves her. And I try to just roll them on that because I grew up in struggle, I understand struggle. I like to be a grassroots advocate and a bit of a pot stirrer myself. 
to make life better for people. So I think that you should hold people accountable, but also um, everything that I've ever put on any of my campaign literature, I still stand by. Um, and I try really hard um, to be a role model for other people and also accept other people at all different le levels being a role model for me. So I don't judge people based on how much money they make, how educated they are. I really try to judge people by what's in their heart. My number one issue is environmental justice and if anyone doesn't know what that is, it's this little red inhaler that maybe all your kids carry around and maybe you do too. I have it in my bag all the time. And it's a real way that um, people of all different colors and all different economic income levels that live in Brockton suffer with environmental justice because society is set up for us to not be able to have the power to say no to these polluting businesses that come into our city. And I think that's one issue that really affects everybody. And um, it's an issue that I talk to people at the State House, and these are people with master's degrees and PhDs, and they have no idea what environmental justice is. And I'm like, you need to come to Brockton because everybody knows what it is here. It's this little red inhaler. Brockton has the fifth highest asthma hospitalization for children in the state every year. So, it, you know, and then some people might care about that and then maybe they get elected and maybe they're friends with the developer that's coming in that's going to pollute and all of a sudden they don't care about environmental justice anymore. That isn't me, but I do see it, Bradley. I understand that that does happen and people do get lied to and the media is complicit in it. So I think that's why having children go through media literacy classes and having adults learn about it is very important. Because all this fake news out there, it isn't just the Republicans calling fake news. It's really a lot of people on both sides perpetrating that. So I, I, I don't I don't like people that aren't representing you. And if they are representing you, and for some reason the media starts besmirching their character, you don't have to jump up and defend them or get into harm's way. But if you like the representation you're getting, you should just re-elect that person. And if you don't, then you shouldn't. So, thank you. Now, we're talking about politics. I didn't know that was coming up, but like, let's face it, that's the reality of the game. Um, good question, Bradley. So here's the deal. Um, I'm gonna tell you a short experience of my life and then I'll take the question into depth. Um, in terms of like what I've done, personally, um, my first job in this country was a boss boy at Crystal's restaurant. How many of you heard about Crystal's? Okay, I worked there for two years as a boy. From there, I worked for the former mayor of Brockton, Linda Balzotti. And then from there, I worked for Governor Patrick, Deval Patrick. And then from there, I worked for Raise Up Massachusetts. How many of you have heard about Raise Up Massachusetts? So, um, in 2014, if I'm not wrong, there was a question on the ballot. It was question four, which was earn sick time for all the Massachusetts workers. How many of you heard about that? Okay, so let's face it. During that moment, I was the regional field director for Ways Up Massachusetts. I was overseeing the entire South Coast. I'd face it 2014, 2010. I was in this country four years, and I was overseeing that. So the question was to make sure that anybody who has a full-time job and working pretty well was able to actually take a break just in case someone got sick or that person as well. So I was able to work and pass that piece of law, which was voted on by the people of Massachusetts, not by the politicians. It was voted on by the people of Massachusetts because it was a ballot question. We're talking about voting now, so that's where I'm going with that one. From there, I started working for the Coalition for Social Justice. I believe some of you heard about the Coalition for Social Justice, and of course, the bad Michelle you brought many times on your elections. And um, in the sense of like what I've done, based on, this is what I've done for six years, and in six months. So now, here's the realization of the question that Bradley just asked me. What makes me different in the sense of those who are already in office? I'm gonna tell you the straight. I believe I'm different because obviously you can see it, I speak with an accent, that's not really too, too different, but I believe I am able to empathize with a lot of folks who are living in this city. And I'm able to understand where they're coming from, what they stand for, and where we want to go. Now, let's just take this as a prime example. So you see, here, we're talking about real substantial issues. Look at the room, not too many people come. But if it was like the gun violence and all that crap, you will see the news. They will motivate you, as you for comment and all of that. Now, how do we change this? 
Well, in order for us to change it, you have to keep on doing what you're doing now. But in terms of like what we have to do, I think we have to educate our people. So education for me is the basic foundation when it's come down to social issue. Because when you are uneducated, not uneducated in school, but uneducated about certain issue, you ended up making decisions based on what somebody tells you. But when you know the issue, and you know the meaning of it, you will make the final decision based on what you think of it. Because you can get information, and the question is, how do you transform the information that you get to somebody else who may not have any idea about it? How do you make it somewhat not too complex? This is what politicians do. They come to you, they ask you for the vote, and they get it, and they move on. I mean, I think now what we gotta do, we have to vote for the folks who understand our values, who know where we're coming from, and who know what we stand for. Education defines my life, guys. Come on now. Six years ago, I could not speak a word of English. Now, here I am on this podium talking to you. Without having access to education, I can promise you, I wouldn't be able to sit in here and speak into that foreign language without having asking anybody to translate for me. We have to focus on educating our young people and help them understand that they can be part of something big. And of course, being bold. I do believe this for my court. Nothing is impossible. Just because you've been there for 15 years, 20 years, 100 years, doesn't mean you know what you're doing. Because the question is, it's not how long you've been there, but it's what you're doing. Because what you've done in the past is done. Now how do you plan to change this? To justify my point, she said it. She was in a relationship, I don't think she liked it. She moved out. Now we shouldn't focus on what she's been through, but it's what she's doing now. We shouldn't focus on what you've been through, but what you're doing now. And I think now we as people, we have a solemn obligation not just to vote, but vote for the person who carries your values. Because like you said, people will always come to you and tell you their story. But the question is, what is their stories? How do you see yourself into this? How do you empathize with them? What gives you a reason to believe that person will be able to do it? Well, let's face it, do you believe I would vote no on something that has to do with education? And knowing that this education will benefit somebody? Do you think I will vote no giving a child an opportunity to learn? Give me a break. We need to have the people who've been there and done it. So this is what I've done in this country, and this is what I'll continue to do. So I know that I wouldn't be able to navigate and implement my point without becoming a US citizen. I choose to be a US citizen. Now the question is, I don't care whether you're born here or somewhere else. You are a US citizen, I am a US citizen. We have to tell our folks who come here, follow the rules, apply the law, to understand that they can be part of this. And to educate our young people. Well, I've seen this in my team. I have a team of 10 people in my campaign right now. To be honest with you, I'm one of the oldest one. I mean, I'm, on, I'm only 27. What I tell them, this is our platform. This is what we believe in. It's not what I think, it's what we think. When somebody come to you and tell you that, well, that's my view, that's my ideology, I think that's a wrong approach. But if they tell you, what do you think about this issue? How do you see yourself into it? Then they give you an opportunity to talk about it. And like she said, you gotta vote for the person you like. Not because I'm Haitian, or not because I'm Cape Verdean, not because I'm Caucasian. Vote for me because you know I can do something. And the thing is that, we gotta be bold, folks. And I said it, just because someone been there for 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, doesn't mean they're doing a good job. We cannot change the same mentality with the same ideology that created it. We have to have a different arms of complexity. And if you do so, it's called insanity. Well, now you are here because you believe in something. You are here because you want to improve something. It becomes your responsibility as a resident to inform about the issues and to make the best decisions. Not me telling you what I want to do, but what do you want me to do? I believe it was uh, Ronald Reagan that had a term called trust but verify. Okay, trust but verify. So when I hear a, po a politician uh, speak on a particular stance, on a particular subject or issue, okay, once I've heard them articulate their stance on that issue, now it's my duty to verify that their character is going to be in line with that particular issue, with that particular stance, and what they articulated themselves on. Is everybody with me on that? Trust but verify. There has to be some verification. I've seen in the community of Brockton where people will vote, and uh, there's a language barrier. 
They might not understand what's on the ballot, but somebody will tell them, hey, you should vote for this person, and this person stands for this, and not having enough verification and putting in a vote that is not the most informed vote that they could give. So I really do firmly believe that if you wanna, if you wanna validate you know, a politician's character, answering your question, Bradley, if you wanna make sure that when they get into office, uh, on whatever capacity that they get in on, that they're actually going to do what they say they're gonna do. There's two components to that. Okay, I trusted what you said, but now I'm gonna verify just to be sure. I'm gonna do my homework. If I didn't understand something, I'm gonna try to understand something. And I'm gonna try to understand both, not only the party that I'm interested in, but also the opposite party's argument and be able to differentiate and distinguish and come to an informed decision. I feel that some people don't make an informed decision when they vote. And so therefore they're not verifying. Is this helping anybody at all? So you gotta tr you trust what you hear, but you gotta verify, verify that person's character. Because sometimes there are pressures that happen uh, when, somebody, when a leader gets into office, there's some things that they won't really had good intentions on doing, but some things that just don't come out to be. So I think that we need, as a community, we need to say, okay, we found somebody that we're interested in, we found somebody whose argument is powerful, who seems to have a stance that's in line with my views and is, line with, is in line with change and community transformation. Now I wanna verify. I want to make sure so that when I make the vote, my mind is at ease that I voted and I did the homework on that particular person. Yeah, but how many people are actually going to do Let's keep it real. So we're going back how here. I'm handing it to you. I'm running up on time. That's what happens when you get politicians on the stage. Wait, Tom, Tom, uh, All right, guys, I, I know we're coming up on time. I have 10 seconds that I want to give you some very practical advice to answer Bradley's question. Number one, I'm, I'm hosting a workshop next. So please come to that. It's about the 2017 elections. I want to hear from you. I mean, I have some things to share, but it's more interactive. I know you have a lot that you want to say, so please come to that class. Also, attending city council and school committee meetings, go, hear what they're saying. Um, set up meetings with them. When you have an issue or, or a disagreement, set up meetings with them. That's what they're there for you. Um, organize, right? Organize around your particular issue. Get people who are like-minded, who want to take action. Um, vote, absolutely, you gotta, you gotta vote. And then lastly, here's what we're not saying. If you don't like what the politicians are doing, then you run, you run. We need more people running this election, so you do it. That's all I gotta say. On that note, we are running on time. Um, I wanted to open up two questions to the to the crowd. Who would like to ask a question? Is there anyone? Anyone? Ask questions. There's someone down there. Wonderful me. So the water that comes from, it is safe, okay? This is a huge, last summer there was a drought. Brockton has our drinking water rights from 1890, not 1990, 1890. We, the water rights that we have, um, 100,000 people rely on those water rights. And last summer, a politician from the area that our water comes from, decided that he was going to use the, um, the drought to scare Brockton into thinking that the algae that was created in one of the ponds adjacent to the pond that Brockton gets our drinking water from was going to go into our drinking water pond and make us sick. So there's a huge multi-million dollar facility down in Dighton that cleans the um, down in, um, by Silver Lake that cleans our water before we drink it. It is, it, it may not be as clean as other municipalities, like a lot of um, urban communities, but it passes all DEP and EPA regulations for safety. Could it be better? Sure, there's always room for improvement. But this is another example of how the system was being manipulated to make us say, yeah, we are, we're the reason that the pollution happened in a town 30 miles away, which was a lie, and that to solve that, we need to buy a $78 million desal plant that we don't know if it works or not, which could all then put together, and then Brockton gives up our drinking water rights, and then the towns down there get the drinking water. People do long, many year, well thought out ways 
for us to turn against each other and hate ourselves. So our, our drinking water is clean. That was a manipulation, and we all should be careful about it. Again, media matters. Uh, in terms of substance abuse help, um, I, I don't know the number off top, but there's a substance abuse Massachusetts helpline that anybody can call, it's toll free, and, and they could uh, cater that individual to the services around their, their community. Um, so that's, uh, we have a, a resource here, High Point, I used to work for High Point for a little while too, um, that provides substance abuse services, and, and it's a mecca of, of services for individuals suffering from substance abuse. But we need empathy, we, they, they just can't stop automatically, we, we need to um, understand the human that, that's inside and not just accuse them of just, you know, uh, doing drugs. It, it, it's a real uh, medical condition and we need more empathy for that population. There's also a, a, a group called the SAFE Project out of Brockton, run by Corey Finney. I'd encourage you to re um, find him. I can also get in contact with you and give you his uh, communication. He does a lot of work with substance abuse right here in Brockton. On that note, there is an organization out there that specializes in homelessness as well. So you should go and check them out. Um, okay, okay, okay. Is there anyone else who has any questions? Last one? I know there was another hand. No? Before we go, oh. I would be remiss if I didn't give the National Domestic Violence Hotline number. If you know anyone in your midst that may be facing domestic violence, someone that you um, are not necessarily friends with, but you see them coming to work and you know that there's something happening, or someone just in your area, I urge you, it takes a victim out of seven to 10 times to actually leave an abusive relationship. You, you, a lot of times we hear folks say, well, I told her to leave and she went back. I told her to leave and she went back. Well, maybe she likes that kind of thing. That's why she stays. No, it's not that. People are going through a mental hole when they're dealing with domestic violence relationship. It's not an, a, something that they leave just like that. It takes, it takes a while, it takes counseling, it takes, and they need help. So, if you know someone, the easiest thing that I urge you to do is to give them the National Domestic Violence Hotline number so that when they reach their breaking point, meaning when they are ready to leave, because the more we tell them go, the more we tend to stay. So, when they reach their breaking point, they have that number, they can call and get educated. I urge you to call it at anonymously and get educated yourself about how to help someone in your midst. The number is 1-800-799-SAFE. Again, 1-800-799-SAFE. You call that number anonymously. You can find out about resources in your area, right in Brockton. Many people do not know that Family and Community Resources is an agency that services domestic violence victims, as well as the agency that Inez worked for, Health Imperatives. They have a shelter here right in Brockton called Penelope's Place. I urge you again to call and just get educated about the way that you can help someone that may, you, you may come into contact with. Thanks. Okay. And um, in closing, in closing, I, wanted to, I actually wanted to ask um, each and every one of you to close out um, any last remarks, and then we'll give a round of applause for the people on the panel. So I'm going to try to set the standard here and be brief so that we could get out of here in one, one minute. Um, closing thoughts. Uh, care enough to act. See, whatever your issue is, we're not going to agree. Um, we may agree. But whatever your issue is, do something about that issue. And, and also open your heart to, um, I'll, I'll say this. I was reading a definition of social justice that really challenged me. And it basically said, you can't pick and choose your social justice issue. If you are really for social justice across the board, then you have to be an advocate for all oppression. So you can't just, you know, if you are, 
uh, against immigrants for whatever reason, but you love uh, LGBT um, you know, causes, in the true definition of social justice, you have to be empathetic to all forms of oppression. And I'll leave you with that. Closing thing. Um, well, guys, I just want to say that I just opened this Latin Women Association in Prattum, and I will downstairs. I'm going to do a workshop and know your rights. You just can come downstairs. I have cards over there with my name and my number, and I'm located at Latin uh, Family Center, in second floor. And just because I talk about domestic violence, I am a victim of domestic violence, so I help a lot of people with that. Also, I help with immigration. So if you find anyone who speaks Spanish and needs some help, give my car. I will be glad to help them. Uh, excellent. Um, in closing, I would like to thank each and every single one of you uh, for taking your time to be here, and of course, the organization that hosts this. And um, I would be remiss not to give a shout out to Janine. I think she's amazing. Thank you for giving. Come on now, do it, guys. Come on now. And um, I, you know, I hope you guys will continue doing this because I think it's amazing. And um, I would like to see more of this. So I'm going to leave you with three letters C plus B and A, which means conceive plus believe equal achieve. When you conceive something, you believe it, you will achieve it. In the critique of pure reason, Emmanuel Kin said, when you stand up, you have to stand up straight. And no matter what, be bold in what you do. And this is something that you do. It's you, it's on you. Take responsibility. I love you all and God bless you. Thank you. I believe that there's a Massachusetts helpline. I think you could dial, is it 611? Someone, what is that helpline? It's 611. So if you know someone that needs help, 211. Thank you, Dennis. 211. So if you know someone that needs help, or you could give them your state representative's telephone number, we field calls to help people every single day. And then we usually facilitate them to other people that might need help. Um, get engaged. Don't judge other people if they can't make every single meeting. That's what I like to say. I've seen a lot of grassroots organizations fail because certain people are super motivated and they attend every single meeting, but then other people can't. And then they're like, well, I'm doing too much. Do what you can do. Expect other people to do what they can do and just keep the ball moving forward. I'm honored to be your state rep and call me anytime. Thank you. I'd like to say that I'm uh, very thankful to have been part of this panel um, this morning. And I'd like to say that it was well organized. Janine, the questions were well put together. I think that we got a lot of information. I'm thankful that some people asked some questions. I want to encourage um, uh, everybody here. I work at a High Point Drug Treatment Center. That if you know somebody, because sometimes uh, certain cultures and uh, you know certain certain languages, certain people kind of hide the fact that they might know somebody that's dealing with a problem and they deal with it in a private way. If you know somebody that's dealing with addiction, uh, please uh, understand that there's a resource at Brockton High Point Drug Treatment Center. We know we got an opiate crisis, uh, so that we can help uh, the community be better. Please uh, take advantage of some of those resources that are out there. Thank you. On that note, can we give our panelists a round of applause? Thank you, thank you, thank you.